Hi everybody, uh, welcome to MBF's latest um, webinar. Uh, I'm Nate O'Connor, product manager here at MBF. We're going to be talking about uh, big data and microscopy using some case studies from neuroscience today. So we'll be joined by uh, Dr. Chip Gerfin, who's coming to us live from Maryland. So welcome, Chip. Hey, Nate, how you doing? Hey, Chip. I've got just a few administrative notes uh, before we start. Um, Let's see. If you, uh, again, I already you heard you heard us working out the audio. So if you have any questions, feel free to um, you know pop them into that question. We try to answer all of our questions um, as they come in. If anyone needs uh, certificate, but we also after the webinar we'll try to hit them too. If anyone needs certificates for the webinar, just be sure to ask in the question pane. Um, also, we're recording the webinar, so you'll get a link to that in a few days. So if you if you miss anything, you'll be able to watch it later. So. I kind of just want to jump into the outline. So big data is a, a buzzword right now. So I, I kind of want to ground us in what it's meant to us and what we've encountered uh, with, with respect to the word big data. And, and that's really for us defined by the challenges that our researchers are encountering. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about what big data is, the challenges that are defining that for us. Um, and then we'll jump in to some case studies that demonstrate really how, we, um, how we've overcome those in some, some situations. One is. You know, if someone wants to publish their data that's really, really large scale data, how do we do that? And I have an example we'll go through. And then uh, Chip's going to jump in and actually uh, talk about his contributions to the GenSat project, um, which is a really big uh, mouse brain, uh, high resolution mouse brain database. And then at the end, we'll talk about a little bit about really analysis. And um, we'll jump in and look at how to get things from whole slide images. And then how to kind of distill the data down and get some measurements out of something that you might want on the small scale once you've had an overview. Um, throughout, again, please um, feel free to ask questions. Um, I, I've seen a few of you have already, so I know that you, uh, you, you know how to do that. Um, and I will try to uh, specify the, um, the technologies that we've used in all of these settings as I, as I go through. So the why and the what of big data. Usually, if you look up big data um, in any realm, you'll, you'll hear about the three Vs. And that's really volume, velocity, and variety. But what, what does that mean in our realm, in the micro, microscopic imaging realm? Usually, uh, what we've found is that we're always facing ever-increasing volumes and velocities. You do have variety. There are new methods like clarity coupled with light sheet imaging or, or two-photon. Um, but by by large, what we hit most are people getting more and more data and, um, and then more efficiently, so quicker. You can get it quicker. Um, so really, what are the implications of that? And again, if you look out there, you'll see a lot of um, kind of speculating about what people are going to do now that you can collect so much data. Um, toward you know asking bigger questions to people saying, well, you might not even since you can collect everything, you might not even need uh, a really well-defined question to start. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that more at the end in the analysis part. Um, but again, uh, it's really these increasing volumes and velocities that we face most often and have to manage for our, our users and ourselves in our office. Um, so what what are some of these challenges and needs that we face? The first one on the list, I think is, I put it there for a reason, um, because it's the one that we, we have to deal with uh, most often, and that's storage, both short and long term. You know, um, Depending on funding and publications, you're required to store, some people are required to store things, um, um, and we certainly store our own stuff in the office here, but there's both short and long term storage. And I think on the, the technology scape, it's one of the most expensive fronts. Um, I'll get specific into that when I talk about the server setups. Uh, I think the next one that's really important is if you're having to share uh, both bandwidth and file formats are important. So if, if you have um, a desire to share or maybe even um, a guidelines that's saying you should share, that you know some of us face those based on funding as well, um, being able to do that efficiently so that you don't eat up your bandwidth is important. And that's really where file formats and compression come in. So, We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, the next thing that the case studies will really run through is, or, is organization. So um, once you have this, you know, this large sets of data, uh, and they're big, how do, you, how do you get them organized? How do you index them? How do you search them? Um, and I think the other one probably that goes in tight association with that is access. How um, are you 
accessing the data who can access the data is it something like the gens that project or the wiley site that we're going to look at that's open to everyone in the world or is it something like parts of the connect on where people apply and are vetted for access to the data and then kind of the last two go hand in hand as well analysis and computational requirements so when we have so much data how do we how do we actually do anything with it um so the case studies that we're going to run through now all go through that and all these challenges are really under the technological constraint of ever increasing volumes and velocities that we face i want to jump out of powerpoint for just a second and actually look at a big data file so this is i got to pull up another set of numbers on the side for reference there we go so this is a mouse brain serial section uh stained with new and cut at 30 microns um, and it's imaged at 100x and you can see I don't know if you can see it, but there's a little yellow dot here in my macro view. And that is actually where we are in the data. So I have high resolution at that spot in my data. And this is a focal series of 40 steps. So this is an entire, entire serial section scan at 100x with 40 optical sections. If you look here, it says the size, and that's a size on disk. It's 50, 50 gigabytes sitting on disk. Now we're actually using uh, this gets to the file formats and compression we're using our own flavor of jpeg 2000 and this is compressed at 20 to 1. so you can imagine it'd be 20 times bigger on disk for and this is one serial section if you step back now for a second and say well this is one serial section i'm interested in the whole brain if you say well it's 30 microns for this section and the brain is oh russell coddle distance of something around maybe seven millimeters or so depending um, on the animal, that's going to be 300, roughly roughly 250 to 300, depending on sectioning events, and we know how that can go, um, serial sections. If I do the math on that, I'm going to end up eventually with a compressed um, brain at 100x for an entire through brain series of 141 ter terabytes. Uh, so, or, I'm sorry, 14 terabytes. That's that's really a big amount, and that's compressed. Uncompressed, it's actually 283 roughly terabytes. Um, so it's really just uh, a, a lot. It's a lot of data. Um, the other thing is, you know, toward the velocity part of things, the actual number of fields of view in that total brain, if we were to do a through series, would be 44 million fields of view. So it really is a, a big data problem. I'm just differentiating the fact that um, in, in our big data realm, we're running mostly into volumetric big data. Um, and the ends are increasing, that, that'll happen, but really the one that we have to overcome most often is, is just how large these data sets are. Um, whereas another setting like proteomics or genomics or drug discovery, you have a large set of images that are independently analyzed. Here they're contributing to being volume, volumetric data. Um, so that, that kind of frames uh, where I'm coming from today when I, when I talk about big data. I want to jump next right into um, a publishing example. And this group um, is from um, Gillard and Carton's work uh, last year in the Journal of Comparative Neurology. They wanted to publish all of the whole slide images that they had associated with this study wherein they took Nile rats, which have a specific distribution of cones in the retina, and, and did intravitreal injections of a tracer and then wanted to look at the circuitry uh, through the brain. So uh, they did that from different cutting orientations and it provided us with those uh, and published them basically to the wiley.bioluzid.net site. Um, so, and that actually that resource is available for, for most author, I think any author with the JCN who'd like to publish uh, complete data. So let's take a look at that. I'm gonna pull up the actual article. Um, there we go. And this article has a, a link right to it, um, and I'm on that page, it has a link right to it to the database so that when you click uh, on that in the article, you're gonna jump onto the Wiley site. It's gonna, I have a list of collections because I've been on here before, but it'll jump right to, right to the server uh, and go to that collection of slides that you wanna see. If I look here, um, they opted to organize things by uh, into folders, subfolders on the server, um, and these are all rearrangeable um, how they want them to be, and the names as well. But um, they did things by cut orientation and staining. So if we go in here and look at, let's well, say we want to look at all of the sagittal GIMP sustained slides that we have here. So if I scroll through here, here are all of my whole slide images. 
And so anyone reading the article can come to these and, and look at specific full resolution imagery. If I do that here, um, they can do that you know, at any time, really, right from the article if they're online. Um, and so I'm just zooming into different areas of the, of the slide, uh, but it's at full resolution. So this is only a 25% zoom. We can easily go down more. So this is associated with their article. You, so you can see, like right off the bat, it's resolution above and beyond what a figure can give you. They um, they decided to have a kind of a, a freeform structure. They're ordered by how the sections were cut, but they wanted people to be able to just get at the data uh, raw. There's also in here they they established a little more of a directed walkthrough. So if I go ordered sagittal sections, they do it do it for their horizontal orientation too. I can click on these. These are hyperlinks, and they go right to a specific portion of a slide. So I can click through these and go right to the sections that I'm interested in. I can go further down if I want to and kind of have a, a stepped walk through all of my, my serial sections. So they have a way that you can freeform, go through the data, and then kind of step through the data. Um, importantly, they wanted to be able to go from the article to the database. Um, another group wanted to go the other way around. And what we did for them, they wanted to go basically from the database to their article. So what we did for them was to um, put up high resolution figures with annotations in them. And then within that, you can actually just click, uh, oh, my browser's in my other window. You can click on that box and it, that annotation in their high res figure and it will bring you right to their article online. Um, so we've had to say, okay, well, in publishing large amounts of data, people want to go back and forth really. Uh, and so that's that's something that we had to make sure that it, basically all of our, our, our web technology supported that. Um, and this is actually on a bioluce. But to talk about for a second uh, before I move on, um, you, to get specific about the technology for a second, I just wanted to mention that um, what kind of servers do you need for such a task? Uh, one uh, very typical, this is a very typical server um, that we've employed is we have them sitting on virtual machines so they can be spun up very easily. Um, so that's a, a kind of attractive from an IT perspective. Um, and the footprint uh, isn't that large. And that's largely because, I'll show you here for a second. Uh, that's in part because of um, the file formats and uh, efficient file formats and, and transmission of uh, the technology that we're using. But um, a typical server is uh, around eight gig of RAM and four processors. Um, and again, that's that's not an expensive prospect for a virtual machine, even on a solid state, you know, solid state drives at some server farm. I, I see pricing on that between, I, I would say, mm, seventy to one twenty or one thirty per month. Um, about like a cable, well, cheaper than my cable bill anyway. But um, so it's it's in the realm of affordability, uh, and. I will point out one other thing. If you look here and say, okay, I'm gonna click on these tags, I wanna see all of my all of my sagittal sections. I can kind of mine through and click on, and there are all of my all of my files that are cut, and these are arranged um, by the order they were actually added to the database. But um, and you can change that by saying, Oh, I want to sort by name or sort by file type. But you'll see there's a lot of different whole slide formats and, and they're all um, from different devices. So that's that's a very typical thing we run into as well, is that uh, the different scanners or, or even microscopes for collecting large montages or whole slide images um, have their own formats. Um, so that, that I would say is another, um, some are more amenable to being streamed over the internet than others. Um, and those are things that we've had to um, kind of work with uh, for our researchers who really want to have their, their data out there, or, or even if they're using this as a tool to uh, manage the large amounts of data in their, in their facility. Um, so we try to support as many of these big data formats as possible. Uh, so I'm going to close this off now. So those are really two, uh, two examples of people who were publishing data and one group wanted all their data out there, uh, and the other group wanted their high-res figures and a link back to their paper. Chip is going to jump in now and talk about his product, our second, or, or his project, sorry, uh, our second case study, which is his contributions to the GenSat project. And just to set this up a little bit, um, right now it's it's compressed data, so we've got 440 gigabytes of compressed data for I think around 170. Um, mouse brains uh, and to put it in perspective each of these each of these brains has um, 
about 110 serial sections in it. Um, so I'm just bringing up some numbers on the other side here. And so in the database, there are actually over 20,000 whole slide images, um, fluorescent images, multi-channel images. So it really is a, a large amount of data. And each of those 20,000 whole slide images has 20, uh, 200 fields of view comprising that slide. So if, for the entire project, eventually, uh, when all the brains get up there, well, I think we're going to actually have over 14 million fields of view in the database. So it really is a big data, but again, the big data are going to volumetric contributions. Um, so I will bring up the article that this was discussed in and let uh, Chip take over. So again, it's, it's a great, great pleasure to be able to uh, welcome Dr. Uh, Chip Gerfin from Maryland today. Hi, Chip. Hey, Nate. How are you doing? Great. Um, so uh, this was, that was a, a great introduction. Um, my name is Chip Gerfin. I'm at the National Institute of Health in Bethesda. And I just want to talk about the um, real power of the ability to put you know, large uh, anatomical data uh, on a website like the BioLucida website. And the particular problem we had was that um, a project that Nat Hines at Rockefeller University in my lab at NIH did together was to generate uh, transgenic mouse lines in which Cree recombinase was directed to specific neuron subtypes. Uh, these, this is an incredibly valuable resource, particularly in this day and age when there's a lot of studies that are using optogenetics, uh, where one wants to, scientists want to, um, you know, direct uh, an optogenetic uh, <coughs> tool to be able to functionally manipulate, um, you know, one type of neuron versus the other, like dopamine neurons and the striatum direct indirect pathway neurons. And the Cree transgenic lines um, enable that to be done. Um, we generated, as part of this project, um, over 250 of these lines, each with each mouse line had uh, Cree recombinase directed to uh, specific neurons. Now, this is a huge amount of information, and the difficulty we had or encountered was that while we knew that a lot of scientists or researchers wanted these lines, um, different researchers would want them for different purposes depending on what brain region they were interested in or whatever. So how do we get the detailed information to the researchers uh, to allow them to be able to you know, select and choose the particular lines that they want? And uh, we did this by, in the first go round, is by just taking, um, we crossed all of these transgenic lines to a reporter line. Uh, I'm sure, <coughs> hopefully most of you are familiar with the technology, but um, uh, these transgenic lines with Cree recombinase is directed into specific neurons. You can't see Cree recombinase by itself. Um, uh, so what we did is we crossed the lines to a so-called reporter uh, line. And what that does is only the, the reporter shows where Cree recombinase is by generating uh, green fluorescent protein or D tomato uh, that we can visualize. <coughs> we use the technique where we um, did, uh, you know, we cut the sections did standard immunohistochemistry to visualize where the Cree recombinase was located. And in the first database, the main GenSat database that had all of these 250 lines on them, uh, we uh, put up a series of coronal sections from the front of the brain to the back of the brain, and people could scroll through and see those. Well, um, it was fairly difficult to maneuver and figure out exactly you know, which line expressed in what areas. In some, it's fairly straightforward. You know, when people were looking for dopamine drivers or for uh, drivers for dopamine neurons, they would just look for a tyrosine hydroxylase driver line and could be fairly certain or fairly confident where that would be expressed. In areas that are um, more complicated, such as the cerebral cortex or uh, basal ganglia circuitry, um, there's a large number, there's a quite diverse uh, subtypes of neurons in these different areas. And, um, and so we wanted to be able to provide information for scientists to be able to you know, find these lines and, and really uh, look to see which line had the expression in, in the region that they were interested in. <clears throat> so this is a paper that was uh, recently published by us um, uh, in, in Neuron. And we focused in this paper um, to, from those 250 driver lines, we selected those that were um, in uh, cortical and basal ganglia circuitry. Do I have control of the... Uh, yes, I do. sure do. Okay. So this is a diagram um, showing... Let me just zoom up on this diagram a little bit. 
this is a standard diagram of the uh, organization of the um, of the cortex and the basal ganglia. Um, and what I wanted to what I would emphasize here is that the cortex, of course, has uh, six layers, and neurons are distributed in different uh, neurons distributed in different layers um, are distinct in terms of what air, what other parts of the brain they connect with. So neurons in layer two, three provide connections with other cortical areas. Neurons in layer five um, provide projections to other uh, within the cortex, but also um, downstream into the striatum and um, to other areas. Uh, and neurons in layer six provide projections to the thalamus. So we have Cree lines, this paper describes Cree lines that are expressed in uh, these different layers. Um, but also within the layers, there are different subtypes of neurons that need to be identified not just by where they're located, by actually, but by um, uh, their axonal projections. So in this study, what we did was to um, we did was to combine both uh, reporting, use the reporter and uh, injections of a viral construct in which. Uh, there was a Cree-dependent expression of um, green fluorescent protein or tomato so that we could trace and look at the details of the axonal projections from specific neurons. Now this is a lot of data and uh, a lot of information in this um, and in, a, in, in the paper what we can do is provide you know small uh, or we can provide figures that have a lot of information and this is a case um, an example from one of the lines RBP4 is the the gene driver KL100 is a specific line. So this is this back uh, this transgenic line RBP4 KL100. Uh, this first column shows the expression just with the reporter. So where there's green is um, the uh, where the Cree recombinase neurons are located, and they're located in layer five through almost all of the neocortical areas. Now in layer five, there's two subtypes of cortical neurons one of which uh, projects um, to just within the cortex and to the striatum, and another that's called the intertelencephalic or IT line, or IT neuron type, and another subtype projects from the cortex into the striatum and then downstream into the thalamus and to a bunch, a number of other brain regions, the thalamus, subthalamic nucleus, superior colliculus, and all the way down to the brain stem and the pons. So even though these neurons are located in layer five, distinguishing what subtype of neuron is dependent on these, um, these viral injections. So again, in a paper, what we could do and what we did do was to provide, you know, examples of sections, um, you know, from coronal sections through the brain. And you can see, um, you can see, uh, uh, you know, we can show magnification or show higher and higher magnification. But again, one just gets a small, you know, sampling and it's dependent on whatever the author wants to look at or whatever the author presents. Uh, whereas the researcher might, um, you know, who's interested in this particular line, might be interested to know, you know, more detail. And so what we did was to um, uh, provide this information in the standard form in, a fi in the figures in the paper, but then um, put this on the database, on the uh, BioLucid database. Nader, you're gonna have to help me getting to back to I the can database. Open, yep, I can fire okay. that up for you right here. Uh, so yeah, here's right in the. Um, I've already opened some brains uh, in the tab, so you can just jump to. Um, but this first page is the is the is is basically your database. So you're you're in there already. So from the paper, and uh, you can jump directly to this database that contains, um, you know, brains from uh, that paper that we described in that paper. And when it first pulls up, it's the Gensat Cree brains um database, and um, you know it first just you know lists all of the the brains and their um, their uh, named again. The convention that we use is the gene driver. This is a nicotinic receptor subtype five, and then the specific um, line name, which is uh, in this case NP three hundred six. And then this is a, a brain that just had the reporter in it. Um, and one can, uh, you know, uh, view the particular uh, brains by clicking on the thumbnail. Um, we'll get to that later. Uh, 
you know, all of we just here they're just listed I think just by um, uh, alphabetically <laughs> so that uh, there's uh, I think 150 different uh, brains that are in this database um, and all. A more useful way is to actually go up and search and uh, in this um, in this uh, you know the way that we've organized this is that uh, this is again focused on uh, cortical and basal ganglia um, circuitry. Um, first thing one can do though is search by the particular gene or the driver line so there's uh, you can go if you know the particular driver line of interest uh, we go down. Let's look at that one that I was showing before, the RBP4 KL100 line. So we click on that and search. It brings back, um, you know, brains that uh, are uh, uh, from the transgenic line RBP4 KL100. Now, um, and you have all these brains from different injection regions, right? Is that what the the other part of that name means? Right. I'm sorry. I didn't yet yeah, didn't mention that. So sometimes the uh, the brain just has the is just uh, imaging the reporter. And in other cases, we've injected the virus, which is an AAV virus, and this shows the, that it's an AAV virus injection. And we've injected into the primary motor cortex, and this is the animal number. It's just a, our convention. Um, have you loaded in the um, so in standard, what one would do would be to you know, click on the thumbnail, and then it would bring up the um, uh, bring up the uh, the case. So, um, all right. And now, one thing in this, uh, since it's a web, it's a uh, database that's over the web. It takes some, uh, you know, a short time to load in the images, and it's uh, short when you're um, working yourself. But uh, for the purposes of this demonstration. Uh, Nate preloaded this preloaded this in. So I want to talk a little bit about what this is. So th what we've done here is um, we've taken, and this is again an incredibly difficult work that was done by um, uh, you know uh, Christina Warner and Ron, Ron Poletsky in my lab. Um, we cut every brain section, um, you know, cut every section through the brain in a coronal series, and then. Uh, react for uh, immunohistochemistry for um, uh, the reporter, which in this case is shown red. So th this uh, coronal, we use uh, uh, standard immunohistochemical techniques, but we um, label or react every coronal section through the brain, 50 micron sections, they're free floating uh, to get uh, good immunohistochemistry. And then what we've done is to uh, react them and then <coughs> on microscope slides, and then image them at high resolution. And then um, Ron has come up with some uh, really spectacular ways of putting these, uh, s these image sections back together. Um, and uh, so that we end up with a product where we, we put it into this stack that's loaded into this database. And so this is um, uh, one of the cases of an RBP4 KL100 line. Uh, and you can see the reporters in red. And so this is a layer five of, um, so one thing I'd say is that, you know, this is real histochemistry, so sometimes you get, you know, artifacts. <laughs> uh, that's inevitable, but it's still, um, you know, uh, it's every section and they're put back together. And now we're seeing that this is the uh, location of the viral injection, <clears throat> and this is injected into uh, part of the motor cortex, and there it's going to be labeling only those Cree neurons, only those neurons that have Cree in them, and then we can follow the axons down into the striatum. They send their axons down into the striatum. And then they can follow the axons as they course all the way through down into the uh, internal capsule. Down, they have some branches and collaterals that go up into the thalamus, subthalamic nucleus, superior colliculus. Anyway, so this is, um, uh, what we've done is basically done a, a you know reconstructed the entire brain at a very high resolution. You can go to well, you're at three percent zoom now, and now you're going to yeah. So now we can now you can zoom up to higher you know even higher resolution. And so at high resolution, you we can um, you know, scroll through, and you can see uh, you know see the axons as they come through. You can also turn off the um, the reporter and just see the
to see the uh, course of the axons as they come through. So another example, I think hopefully this is good. This is another example where um, that RBP4 uh, line labels both subtypes of neurons in the stridum. It labels the um, in the both subtypes of neurons in uh, layer five of the cortex, both the IT and PT uh, lines. This is a line uh, KJ18, uh, SIM1 KJ18, that labels neurons that are only the um, they're primarily primarily the pyramidal tract type of uh, um, neuron. And so these, you can see that these neurons are located in layer 5B. And we can follow again their axons down into the striatum. And then they course all the way down into the subthalamic nucleus and thalamus and all. Again, I want to emphasize you know, the incredible detail that one, one can provide. Oops. Sorry. So technology is a wonderful thing. It's amazing that I'm driving uh, the screen that's in Vermont from my uh, lab here in Bethesda. But sometimes it gets a little bit uh, tricky. So again, th this has the ability that we can turn off the nissel stain, just look at the, um, the axons and um, Resolution here is quite uh, quite remarkable. So these are projections down into the um, into the thalamus uh, into the subthalamic nucleus. So the point I wanted to emphasize here is that you know one of the uh, um, incredible advances that uh, we've had now with uh, the ability to put our data online like this is that anatomical data has always been difficult because it's difficult to quantify and it's it's a lot of it's uh, visual <coughs> and you know people are interested in different parts of the brain and have different you know want to see different things so in papers what we've been typically limited by is just being what we can put into figures but now we can put um, you know really high resolution images um, in these databases which is quite uh, uh, um, you know, I th quite useful for you know people that want to look at this, and and I want to just emphasize how stunning some of this uh, data can be. This is another from another case from that uh, KJ18 line, and here we've done we've made three injections into different um, regions with virus viral constructs that uh, can be um, you know generate different uh, forms of GFP. So you can really pick apart the, the, the circuitry very specifically based on where you inject. Exactly. So this is um, uh, an injection, the uh, GFP injection, um, and then uh, a tomato injection is going to be um, come up in red, and then we use another injection. Anyway, so we can see quite, um, uh, you know, we can start to pick apart not just the, you know, where it projects, but also the relationship, the topographic relationship, and so, um, and again, the the resolution that is provided is uh, quite remarkable. So these are, you know, injections from three different cortical areas into the thalamus, showing the topographic relationship, and you can see, um, you know, we have quite uh, quite incredible um, uh, morphologic detail that one can see. Okay, so. Um, Anyway, I think that that hopefully provides a glimpse of the type of information that's available or can be put onto a website like such as this. And um, turn it back to you, Nate. Yeah, I, I think that's great. I, you know, we've gone through a couple cases, all the way from someone putting up their figures to someone putting up all their raw data to a case like yours, where you've actually you've painstakingly gone through and and extracted your data and got it up at full resolution into reconstructed brains. Um, and that kind of goes nicely right into the next section here. Um, I'm just going to close this up here. Uh, and that's really, uh, you know, what do you do with the data once it's up? Once it's up, either on a database or it's, um, or you have it in your lab. How, how do you either, you know, view it for one thing, 
i mean how do you actually get numbers out of it so i want to i want to talk to that just a little bit here so i'm going to jump out of power point again because and we're going to go over to my other screen here so i just want to show you know the first step really um that we had to work on to uh be able to um get data from these is actually to i'm jumping in i'm going to grab a data set here is actually we worked quite a bit with chip is to be able to extract some of these um, and so the, the first the first step in that and it's asking me for pixel scaling but this is a whole slide image one of yours chip and the first step of that is really saying okay how do i how do i outline these and then get them get them into something that um i can start to register um, so that's kind of a, a first piece of the technology another so that you can do things like I'll show up something here really quick so that you can do things uh, and take those all of those brains that that chip had I'm just going to connect to another server really quickly and actually open up a brain And even render it. So now it's it's actually it's pulling down the data that it needs at a specific resolution to to do things like um, uh, different types of visualization. So if you see here, there's one of those those uh, Cree dependent viral tracers from the injection site all the way to the back of the brain, and I, th I think some Cree signal as well um, throughout. So um, so the technology that's one of the things that we've had to start to develop is the ability to okay i have these few, I, we can scan we've been able to scan for a long time these huge whole slide images at high resolution but how do we start to actually do things with it um and this this particular technology is about giving you an overview of the data that are there um what about and and you can do that for for other brains as well uh, for instance um, if i look really quickly here at the um the i'm going to pull up another one if I look quickly at um, the data from the 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 article we were looking at earlier, um, oops, I went to the wrong server. So if I go to my one of the shuttle server here, I will say on, on a specific on on your server chip because you're you're pushing out 3D data. Uh, we actually I think have 16 gig of RAM on yours instead of eight. So just on that virtual machine that we're using there. But you know here's here's another one here. If I go into 3D mode on this, it'll pop up in just a second here. I can take a min projection because this happens to be um, data that is bright field um, as opposed to fluorescent. But you can see, I can see the actual projected through trace of the cholera toxin B, um, all the way from, you know, not quite the injection site, but down into the, the brain regions where it projects. So really technology from getting uh, the all the slides, because if you think about it, having a series of slides with a lot of high resolution data on it is a big data problem. Um, so the next step is really letting people look at, let, letting look at it in a, in a meaningful, useful way, uh, like chip is done and like um, the, the rendering that we're starting to be able to do. Um, how do you get some numbers on this? So I just want to look at one last example. Here. Um, oh, I see someone has a question about um, the audio is not coming through. I hope, I hope that we're coming through now. Um, if not, uh, just let me know. I, I don't want to. Um... Okay. So one uh, one other thing here. Um... Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Appreciate that. One other spot uh, I'll show really quickly um, is getting toward that point of okay. I have really large data sets, and I have an overview of it. Now I want to dig in a little bit and try to get some information out of a very specific area of it that I happen to be interested in. Another researcher might be interested in something else. Um, but So I'm going to load up a, a clarified section of brain. It's on the orders of millimeters thick. It's asking me again about the scaling to make sure it's right. Um, and so it's loading the planes. You probably can't see that on your screens, but it's going to pop up. It used a, a clearing method and then some two-photon microscopy to go through a few millimeters of mouse brain. 
Now I'm going to go into quad view here and zoom in a little bit. So this is really the column of data. And I'm going to zoom in here right now. Let's shift a little bit here so we can see things a little better so that you can see um, on your monitors. I'm going to move my pivot point, so that's just setting where I'm rotating about. And so I've gone into this, this column of you know, deep data and started to really um, sp specify a region that maybe I'm interested in. And maybe in there I want to do things like um, detect, detect a, um, some soma. And I could change that a little bit. Um, so I could go through and, and start to, to really make mathematical models of, of very specific regions that I'm interested in. This, I believe, was CDB, is the clearing method. Someone just asked me that. So um, that, that's what that looks like. Um, and the, or maybe I want to go in, and I'm going to go in a little bit more for the zoom here, and start to trace a tree interactively here. So I'm just going to set that up. And as I do that, you see, it helps to be able to orient yourself in three dimensions so I can see what I'm actually, what I'm actually starting to trace here. Um, and if I click here, it's going to load up the sub-resolution I'm interested in. Um, so really tools that will that will allow you to um, go in and and from these large data sets go in and be able to interactively um, either interactively or automatically go in and get um, numbers from them are 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 important and useful um, and so we're, we're talking toward that a little bit today um, so this would be a case where I was talking before how much of your big data are you going to use? And you can see me kind of just walking along this, this process here. Um, and then when I spin around, there it is, in, traced in three dimensions. So this is, this is an, a method that's uh, semi-automated. So it actually will walk along the neuron for you. And I can do that over here as well. So I might go through, and from this big data set, I might, I might pick a, uh, just a sub-portion of, of the, the neurons that I'm interested in. So that's what I was talking about earlier about some people are seeing the big data problem as a, a data, as a data reduction problem, really, because what we would store in the end here, yes, would probably be the original data for a long time, but also uh, really compressible you know, formulas, basically mathematical representations of my data. Um, I'm just trying to, uh, so we looked at, well, I need to go back to PowerPoint now. So those are a couple of um, examples toward analysis of things. Um, we're looking at um, now, just to summarize here, um, we went through really defining what is big data. And again, that's because for us, it's really what our users are trying to do. And it's inevitably trying to handle large, large things. Um, specifically volumetric data. So those are, I think that's one of the biggest challenges. We looked at what happens when someone really wants to publish all their slides, what happens when someone wants to take data from those slides and, and get them into registered mouse brains that are available and open to the public. Um, and then a little bit about, you know, how do you get an overview? How do you visualize that data um, for, for drilling down and actually getting some numbers uh, through that? Um, the idea, only thing I didn't mention was what computer I'm on today. I, the workstation that I'm working on that was running some of the uh, visualization stuff is pretty standard. It's got a, lot, a good amount of RAM. It's got 64 gig of RAM in it. Um, and it has a, I think, a 2 gigabyte graphics card. So it's not a supercomputer by any means, but it's, um, it's, it's got a nice amount of RAM on it. Um, with that, I really want to uh, go to my thank you slide. And Chip, thanks so much for coming and being with us today from Maryland. Uh, and I'm going to jump on to some questions in a second. Um, I would just mention that the neuron tracing that you just saw um, for these large stacks is going to be, uh, we're going to do a workshop on that. Uh, and it's going to cover general neuron reconstruction and analysis. But that's right before the Saturday before um, uh, the Society for Neuroscience annual meeting starts. And there's more information on that there. Um, we'll be at the meeting. Uh, we're by the posters, by a big aisle, so come see us at booth 1337. We'll, we'll be there. We'd love to see you. Um, I'm going to be talking about the, um, that part of where we were automatically sec uh, grabbing uh, sections at full resolution from series of slides and uh, reassembling. I'm going to be talking about that at Pathology Visions in San Francisco uh, later this month. That's a Monday at 1030. I'll be talking. Um, and then um, also um, some of the methodologies we used to organize the data for the carton paper that we went through, the, uh, the Nile Rat Brain paper, 
That's um, in an um, that's covered in part in an article that uh, just came out today. Actually, I just got the PDF uh, today, and the citation uh, was emailed to me in uh, the latest current protocols in, in neuroscience. So check that out. That's got a lot of details in it too. Also, you're welcome to review um, everything you've seen today uh, by downloading our viewer from biolucida.net. It's free, and you can connect to the various databases that you've seen. Uh, I just also want to give a, a nod to um, the fact that we're uh, developed with support from SBIR grants that are out of the NIMH. Uh, feel free always to email me questions, too. Uh, so it looks like we have some questions, which I can talk, talk to here. Um, the images that I was showing for 3D tracing um, were, um, along with chips format, is, and I think this is what you mean, is um, JPEG 2000. So they're, they're compressed with the JPEG 2000 um, algorithms, uh, kind of our own flavor of it. Uh, not, the, not algorithmic me, but more like file, in, with respect to the file format, how the file formats are arranged. Um, so let's see. Oh, I, oh those, those, I believe those were from two photon microscopy, the, that, that imagery. Um, And uh, yeah, certainly someone was asking if, um, if the clarity technique could be used with selective plane microscopy. Yeah, I, I think people are actually uh, using that technique with things like light sheet microscopy to, to image, to image that, those types of cleared uh, organs and brains. Um, there is Linux support, someone asks. Uh, the actual BIOS servers um, can run on uh, Windows 2008, 2012, and uh, uh, CentOS, uh, both six and the latest we've, we're most tested on. Um, yeah, and that someone brings up a question of that. Um, someone brings up the question of um, can our software. Um, use, uh, can our analysis software access the database uh, and pull down images from it? And yes, uh, def most definitely the answer is yes to that. Uh, someone asked about, specifically about the JPEG 2000. Um, in in the two-dimensional virtual slides, you should be able to open that JPEG 2000 in most other software. Uh, the 3D, there's no standard really out there right now for how people are doing um, um, the JPEG 2000 in 3D, but we are, we're happy to work with, with folks on, on what they need for that, for sure. Uh, we have and we actively have been doing that. Um, I think that some of the others uh, we can answer maybe offline. Um, so I real oh sorry my mic was off. So I really uh, want to just thank everyone for attending today. It was really a pleasure. I were you know this has been a real challenge. So it's really exciting for me today to get to kind of represent what we do and talk about the the technologies that we're really uh, we're, we're we're developing here. It's it's really exciting stuff. So thanks everyone so much. And uh, I'm, with that, I'm again to Chip. Thank you, and I will uh, sign off. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Chip. Bye bye.